when it comes to Jews not worshiping graven images, <clears throat> um, we have the, uh, sn the copper snake as well as the Karuvi. Um, what are the significance of those and how are they not considered uh, you know, idols or such? Yeah, so uh, you're right. When there was a, a Magefa, so HaKadosh uh, Baruch commanded Moshe to make a copper snake and put it on a banner. And when people would look at the copper snake, they would live. And the Gemara in Rosh Hashanah says, how could that be? Uh, does the snake have any koach to give refua? So it says it was a way of causing the people to look upwards to Hashem and pray to Hashem. By the way, the copper snake is the symbol of the American Medical Association. You might know, and they got it from, from, from the Chumash. So the, the, the Gemara itself, or the Mishnah itself says that this was a vehicle to cause them to focus on HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And indeed, it's brought down that Chizkyo HaMelech, at a much later time, because people began to worship the copper snake, he ground it up, he cut it up, he destroyed it. Uh, the snake of Moshe Rabbeinu was destroyed precisely because it degenerated into Avedi Zara. Now, the second example is uh, the Kruvim, uh, and indeed, uh, the Kuzari has a very interesting discussion about this. Uh, the Kuzari points out, like Rashi points out, that Bichlal, there wouldn't even have been a Mishkan had there not been a Chedo Egel. The, 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 Egel the, the Mishkan is a response to the Chedo Egel. That once we need, as it were, some type of tangible way of connecting to Hashem, he gave us the, uh, the, 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 the Mishkan. So the Kusari says that because the Jewish people showed that they had a tremendous taiva for Avedah Zara, and they wanted to represent God in a physical, tangible way, so it was a concession to our weakness, but in a way that it's covered up, that it's mechuse, that it's not visible, that you never see it. In other words, the concept is Hashem legitimated a certain Yetzir Hara that was very powerful, but he did it in such a way that we would not really be that connected or involved in it. So the Kuzari actually says the Kruvim was a concession to the Yetzir Hara of Avedi Zara that came out because of the Egel, and had there not been a Chet Egel, there wouldn't have been Kruvim, and in fact, there wouldn't have been a Mishkan. The concept would be, until, uh, before the Chet Egel, every single place would have been just as holy. In other words, if you think about it, the Mishkan is really a demotion, because it's basically saying you can only serve Hashem in a special place, under special conditions, and that was the Yerida as a result of the, of the Chet Egel. secular subjects into Haredi schools or city schools, especially in light of the newest article that came out in the New York Times a few days ago about the extremely poor levels of performance yeah. in New York schools. Yeah, uh, there was, you know, as, as you pointed out, there was a very, very well publicized article in the New York Times about the low level, the low quality of the secular education in Hasidic schools. And uh, in Eretz Israel, as you know, this is a running debate in which the government wants to upgrade uh, some of the secular uh, studies. So he here is the thing, you know, this is really an issue. That, you know, no, nobody is totally right or totally wrong here. I mean, sometimes the Torah community portrays those who want more of a secular education as Rishayim, as Amalek, as evil. And then the other side is portraying the, the, the strict Torah view as people that uh, are uncivilized and the like. And both of those extremes are, are very wrong. Uh, meaning, what I need to know is this. Uh, is it important for uh, a Hasidic boy or girl to know math, to know science, and the like. So what you have to look at is, well, do these people grow up and make a living? Are they able to support their families? Are they happy? Is there shalom bias? Is there family breakdown? Now, if a couple wants to be poor and ignorant of secular studies, but they're happy and they make a living with dignity and their family is well adjusted, then I don't care. Then who cares if they took calculus or didn't take calculus? If, on the other hand, the result of this educational system is creating people who are not able to cope uh, in a modern society, that is a problem. So it's not a problem per se, did you take this course or take that course? The question is, what are the long-term repercussions? And 
people argue over this. There are people that say, well, listen, if the average Hasidic guy didn't take advanced mathematics, he's still able to take care, take care of his family, and within his community, he's fine. You know, he learns Torah, he raises his kids, his kids are happy. What is the issue? And I actually agree with that. But if we can show, or if it could be demonstrated, that people are really, really suffering because they don't have these basic tools to be able to function in society, then I think there ought to be something uh, to improve that situation. I mean, after all, the Mishnah and Kedushan, when it talks about the obligations of a parent towards a child, one of those obligations is to teach your child a parnasa. Give your child a way to make a living and take care of a family. Now, we commonly assume that education is the best way. But education is not the only way. You know, there could be job training things. There could be uh, setting people up in business. In other words, we don't have to have the blinders that only a, what is a four-year college education or even a four-year high school education is the only way a person could make a living in the world. Right? So that, that's where I think the issues get, get exaggerated. And you know, the other thing I don't understand is I don't really understand what the New York Times is doing here. I mean, this, this is not a new issue. I mean, this is an issue that everybody has known about uh, probably 50 years, <laughs> really. There's, not, there's nothing new in this article whatsoever, but you know, it's gotten publicized, and this is part of the New York Times' uh, historic attack on all aspects of Judaism and Israel, which they, which they love to do. But, that's, the, uh, but that, that's what I think the issue is. I think the issue is we get too locked into the idea that only in this particular way can people be well integrated in a society, and you know, that's really not, not necessarily the case. It might be the case, but not necessarily. Yeah. Um, just as a follow-up to that, do you think that um, mixing secular ed education into a Jewish life um, puts us at risk of being pulled away from a, 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 a dedicated Jewish life? So this is a matter, again, this is a matter of debate, you know, internally within, within the Jewish community. There, there are those people, particularly in Eretz Israel, who feel that the more secular education we put in, the less Torah learning, and then uh, there's the possibility of not assimilation in the sense of intermarriage. You know, we're not going to say, oh, first algebra, and then you'll marry, you'll marry a guy. I mean, it's, it's not going to work. It's not going to work that way. But they feel that uh, you know, Torah learning is so important that we don't need and we shouldn't adulterate it with any type of secular input. There are those who say the opposite. There are those that say, number one, Chazal acknowledge that there is wisdom among the goyim, chachma goyim tamin. And number two, secular education, to some degree, can help you understand Torah. There are sugyas in Ervin, and sugyas in Maseches Sukkah, and sugyas in Kiddush HaChodesh, that can only be understood if you have at least some basic mathematics and basic knowledge of astronomy. So therefore, instead of looking at it as a contradiction to Torah, it can be looked at as a way of augmenting and deepening your Torah knowledge. There is a quote from the Vilna Gaon in a sefer written by his Talmud, Rav Hillel of Shklov, and the sefer is called Kol Hator. It's mainly about Eretz Yisrael and Mashiach, but there's one quote that says, any deficiency you have in secular knowledge will be 10 times a greater deficiency in your understanding of Torah. And in fact, it's well known that the Vilna Gaon commissioned one of his students to make a Hebrew translation of Euclid's Elements of Geometry. It's called uh, Ayel Meshulash, and I think it's even on HebrewBooks.org. And the Vilna Gaon felt it was Kedai to translate Euclid, which for hundreds of years, not so much today, was the base, you know, it's a Greek book, going back to the time of the Greeks. It was the standard textbook. Euclid is essentially the inventor of geometry. Now, you then get into another issue, and that is, well, even if you accept the legitimacy of secular education, you know, that could work for things like math, or that could work for basic science. But once you get into what you might call the humanities, like literature, philosophy, then there's another problem, because the values that you would be introducing might be values that are inconsistent with Torah. Right, so you read uh, some great literature that deals with romantic themes or the themes of love between men and women, even if it's like rated PG, so to speak. But you understand that. So, so there's really two different issues in secular education. One is the issue of Bittel Torah. You're just bringing in secular stuff. You're taking people away from learning. So even if it's very practical stuff, we don't want to do that. 
The other is the issue of values, uh, whether it's in literature, uh, humanities, or even in biology. What are you, you going to do about evolution, right? What are you going to do? Are you going to teach evolution uh, in a biology course or, or whatever it is? So that's a, yet another issue, meaning even if you acknowledge the legitimacy of secular education, you're going to have a problem in devising a curriculum. And today, by the way, it's even getting worse because of, and this is a problem in England right now in particular, because of the issue of uh, gay rights, transgender, and the like, in which the government is demanding that curricula include tolerance and acceptance of all of these different lifestyles. And that's really a horrendous thing. Now, granted, uh, you know, no religious Jew is in favor of persecuting people because they're gay or, or lesbian or whatever it is. I mean, that's between them and God. I mean, I'm not interested in going into people's apartments and seeing what they do. But to teach something publicly as a legitimate lifestyle is obviously very, very antagonistic to Judaism and to the Torah, even though, as I say, uh, we don't have to be homophobic, we don't have to say anything bad, but we don't have to talk about it as it being a good thing uh, either. Uh, and the problem is, once the government starts mandating curriculums, that, that's kind of the direction that they're moving in. So you see that there's actually many, many sub-problems to this overall problem. And uh, that's why there's different levels of opposition. Yeah? How does somebody decide of starting a life in Israel versus continuing a life back home? Um, you know, that, that's actually a very, very difficult question. Uh, first, in terms of basic halakhic background, it's well known that uh, the Ramban uh, takes the position that living in the land of Israel is a positive commandment. Uh, it is a positive commandment to live in Eretz Yisrael. This is called Yishuv Eretz Yisrael. And according to the simple understanding of Ramban, it is not just a mitzvah kiyumis, which means if I do it, I get a mitzvah. Rather, it's a chiv, it's an obligation to live in Eretz Israel. Now, granted, the great Rav Moshe Feinstein does learn in the Ramban that it's a kiyumis, meaning if you do it, it's a mitzvah, but it's not a chiv. Uh, that's what Rav Moshe says, and obviously uh, you can't dismiss it, but it's very, very difficult to read that into the Ramban, and most commentaries understand the Ramban that it's a chiv, the arisa. On the other hand, we do have the Rambam, Maimonides, who does not count Yishuv Eretz Yisrael as a mitzvah. Uh, again, there's a machlokas what that means. Does that mean he doesn't consider it a mitzvah? Or it's a mitzvah, but there's a technical reason why he doesn't count it. That's a machlokas within the Rambam. But let's assume that the Rambam says it's not a mitzvah. So right off the bat, you are <coughs> confronted with two, two opinions among the Rishonim. Is it a chiv to live here? Or is it not a chiv to live here, right? That's one thing. And indeed, uh, the poskim say that anyone who lives in Chutz Laaretz is essentially following the Rambam shita, that it's not a chiv, because if it's a chiv, you're kind of stuck. Now, even the Rambam, who says it's not a chiv, if that's what the Rambam says, does talk about the great spiritual merit of living in Eretz Yisrael. Okay, so what do I now do? I'm a young man, an old man, whatever it would be, what do I do? Uh, do I have to live uh, in Israel? Uh, what, how do I decide it? So the truth is, it's a much more complicated issue. I mean, sometimes uh, people will just guilt you by pulling out the Ramban and saying, you have to live here. The Vilna Gaon says you have to live here, even though the Vilna Gaon didn't live here. But OK, but he actually went. He, he actually started traveling to Israel. He turned back, for, and it's still a bit of a mystery why that was so. The Ramban did live here at the end of his life but only because he was kicked out of Spain because he, he won a debate against uh, a Christian Jewish apostate and uh, they wanted to kill him. Instead, he got a deal in which he was just kicked out of Spain. So even the Ramban only went because he had to go. The Rambam never, the Rambam as a teenager lived in Eretz Israel, but most of his life he was in, in Egypt. So one of the things you have to look at uh, very importantly is, number one, do you have a reasonable Parnassah? And that, that, that is important. Now granted, if a person were to say, I'm not going to make Aliyah unless I can make an American salary, then nobody would ever move to Israel. By definition, there's got to be a financial sacrifice, but you have to ask yourself, is it livable? Is it manageable? Now I know a person's gut reaction might be, how dare I think of money when it comes to the spiritual idea 
of living in Eretz Yisrael. Well, that might be true if you were the Chafetz Chaim or, or someone like that. But the truth is, for most of us, if we're not able to make ends meet, we get broken. And when we get broken, we're not going to grow spiritually. And we're not going to accomplish what we can do in Eretz Yisrael. So, number one, you have to have a basic parnasa, Basic parnasa, not necessarily rich. Uh, number two, uh, you have to look at, uh, if you're married and you have children, you have to look at the chinuch systems here. Now, this could be very, very strange, very bizarre thing to say, uh, but you know, you'd figure Eretz Yisrael would have the best educational system in the world. Well, for some kids, yes, it does. <laughs> for some kids, not, because things are stricter here. Uh, the school systems are less sympathetic to the individual needs of kids. So a parent has to be careful not to sacrifice their children on the altar of the great mitzvah of living in Eretz Yisrael. That's another issue. And there are critical ages. Once a kid is adolescent, it's, it's kind of risky to bring him over to Eretz Yisrael. Not impossible, not impossible, but it's risky. Many people say you have to bring your kid here before the age of six and the like. So that's the second thing. Uh, the third thing is you have to look at yourself, meaning is this an atmosphere that I will grow in? Uh, do I find myself connected to the Rabbeim here, to the yeshivas here, uh, to a Beis Knesset, to a Rav? You know, in many, many ways, of course, Eretz Yisrael has a greater potential for holiness than any other place. But we still need the rabbis, we need the teachers, we need the community, we need the friends in order to be able to grow spiritually. So you have to ask yourself if that's the that's the situation. Now, how are, you going, how are you going to know all of that? The only way you're going to know is, number one, visiting here a lot and spending time here, number one. Uh, number two, talking to people who have made Aliyah. And number three, talking to your Rebbeim and people who, who guide you. Um, I've told many, many people over the years to move to Israel. And I've told many, many people over the years not to move to Israel. Meaning it's not a one-size-fit-all type of, type of issue. Some people will do gewaldic, and some people will crash. Now, it's always a guess. You never know who will be in which category. Uh, but still, that's the type of question you have to ask yourself. Now, the one thing, though, that is very, very important is aliyah must be something on your radar. And this is really a big, big problem. You know, you have yeshiva communities, frumist of the frum, and they don't even have a havamina. They don't even think that living in Eretz Yisrael is even an important thing to consider. They're just, you know, it's not an issue bichlal. And that is a big mistake. That is a big mistake. It has to be a major question in your life. You may decide, after thinking about the question, that it, that's not the right step for you. And that is something I can respect. But to not care enough to debate and ask the question shows a lack of connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu's land. And that's not, not the right thing to do. So I'm, I'm not sure if I answered anything, but that's kind of the issue that you need, you need to consider. And um, now, some people say, it's a some people advocate the concept of a pilot trip, that you kind of say you're coming for a year, try it out, see what it's like, see what you're doing. That way you haven't burnt your bridges, and if things don't work out, you still have the opportunity of going back. And a pilot year is a good way to acclimate yourself. Some people say that. And you know, some people say exactly the opposite, that you've got to burn your bridge. <coughs> because if you always have that bridge back to the diaspora, you'll never psychologically acclimate to the different way of life that's here. So I'm not giving you a psak on this, but I'm saying I, I, I personally think maybe because I look for compromise, uh, that a pilot trip could be a very good way of getting your feet wet and getting you habituated to living in Eretz Yisrael. But I, I can tell you that a lot of people think the pilot trip is not a good idea. You've got to make your decision, fish or cut bait, and uh, don't be in an ambiguous situation vis-a-vis -vis your, your decision. So, Be'ez Rosh Hashem, I hope uh, you will uh, be zocha to uh, be part of what Hashem has given us here in Eretz Yisrael. Yeah. Um, how are we meant to understand how Hashem judges 
secular Jewish people who have never really been exposed to Torah and mitzvah? Well, you know, again, uh, we, have, we don't really know how Hashem judges because otherwise we would be Hashem. But the one thing that's very, very clear is HaKadosh Baruch Hu judges everybody by individual standards. And obviously, it's a Dover Pashat that the person who was never exposed will be looked at in a very, very different way than the person that was exposed. But even the person that was never exposed, HaKadosh Baruch Hu has infinite gradations of subtlety. Could they have put themselves in an environment where they could have known? Did they close their eyes to overtures that were made? In other words, it's not just people exposed, people not exposed. The Kaddish Baruch Hu goes into a much deeper, uh, deeper process. You know, uh, let me mention a story that I've mentioned before. Uh, many, many years ago, I uh, used to uh, work part-time with NCSY, National Conference of Synagogue Youth. Uh, some of you might, have, might know this organization or even have been involved in it. Uh, this is an organization uh, that, uh, that tries to work with teenagers, mainly, mainly from non-religious families, and uh, it's makar of them in various ways with Shabbatones and educational programming and the like. And Baruch Hashem, they have an amazing, amazing record of you know, making people religious and in a very positive way. Now, NCSY is a little controversial because, it, number one, it's co-ed. And uh, number two, there's Kolisha because singing is a very big part of NCSY. Uh, my own Rosh Hashiva didn't like Ner Yisrael boys to participate in NCSY because of all of these halachic issues. And he said, the very a classic line, he said he considered NCSY to be like the Para Aduma. Uh, the Para Aduma purifies all who are impure but it might contaminate the people who are pure. Uh, but the counter-argument is, if you don't have B'nai Torah working in MCSY, so who's going to be the one that's going to be doing all the teaching? OK, but I was already married, so I, I was involved a little bit with NCSY. So uh, those of you that are familiar with NCSY know that Motzei Shabbos, uh, or towards the end of Shabbos, they have a big ceremony called as Shabbos Ebbs Away. Everything is dark, and et cetera. And, and finally, they'll have the big Havdalah candle. And we used to call this true confession time, because in the darkness, as people are singing, uh, different boys or girls get up, and they talk about their life story. And some of those stories are very, very moving. It's like tearjerker stories about how they come to Torah and the different struggles. So I, I remember one particular story, and you, you'll see how this will connect to your question, in which a girl got up, and she made the point that not only are her parents not Shomer Shabbos, but they don't allow her to keep Shabbos at home. So what she has to do is, uh, 11.30 at night, after her parents go to sleep, she goes into the bathroom, and she takes out candlesticks that she's hid, and she lights the candles in the bathroom, and she makes the bracha, and then she blows them out, and then she turns on the fan to be sure that their parents will not detect any smoke. And this is what she does every Friday night that she's home. Now, the truth of the matter is, uh, if, I were, if, I were, if I was writing a test for smicha or Hilcha Shabbos, I would give you this case and I'd say, please identify all of the sins that were committed in this particular scenario. I mean, like a hundred sins. You know, lighting candles and moving muktzah and turning on lights and turning on a fan and making a brach in the bathroom. You know, a million things. He did everything wrong. And yet, I mean, I can't speak for Hashem, but I can't help but feel that her sincerity was so great, her desire to keep the Torah under circumstances that were very, very difficult. Is it possible that Hashem is not going to recognize that sincerity, even though she did everything wrong? And maybe, just maybe, her Shabbos was more esteemed by HaKadosh Baruch Hu than the person who did everything right, but without feeling, you know, Shabbos is so easy for me, I just do it and I go through the motions. We don't know, but Hashem judges the heart. Hashem does not only judge the action, you see? So the din of Hashem is very, very complicated because he looks at everything, past, present, future. He looks at the person's background. He looks at the person's pressures. He looks at the person's stresses. He looks at how much the person tried, even if they were not successful. So there's no question, I can't tell you exactly how lenient it'll be, but there's no question that Tinoch Shanishba is going to be looked at in a totally different picture. 
But as I say, in Tinok Shanishba, there are many gradations because sometimes there are opportunities to know about Judaism that are not explored. And Hashem may say, well, why didn't you, uh, you know, do that? I mean, uh, let's imagine, you know, many of you that are here, or at least in Or Sameach as a whole. So many people who are in Or Sameach were people who lacked background, and somehow they got connected. And it's one of the great mysteries of life. How come you're here, and your friend, who's, you know, as smart as you, and as nice as you, and as good as you, decided not to be here, and continues whatever they're doing? Right? What's the difference exactly? What's the X factor? But as they say in Hashem's judgment, you know, that could be a factor. Like, well, why did he make the choice and he didn't make the choice, right? So that's all I can say, but it, it, it's overall a very, very difficult issue. Yeah? Why do some people go to the Beitah every Yom Kippur, some every Shabbat, some every day, some never? Yeah, so the truth of the matter is they're really different dynamics. They're, they're not all for the same reason. The Svara to go to the Mikveh every day is based on a takana that goes all the way back to Ezra, the time of the beginning of the second temple. This is called takanas Ezra. And the Mishnah follows this rule that when a person has a seminal emission, whether it's through intercourse or stam, they're not allowed to daven or learn Torah until they go to a mikvah. That is the takana of Ezra. And that is, if you learn the third parak of Brachos, you will see that that's the assumption of the Mishnah. Now, those who go to, well, 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 the halacha we paskin, that the takana of Ezra has been nullified and you're not chayim, so that's why we don't. But those who go to the mikveh every day, they want to fulfill the takana of Ezra because maybe uh, either they had relations or they may have had a seminal emission, even if they don't know about it. So they go every day because otherwise, under takana of Ezra, they're not supposed to daven. And they want to be zoyer to be makayim takana of Ezra. Even the Rambam, who paskins that Takana Ezra is bottle and you don't have to do it, says in his whole life he never missed Takana Ezra. Right, so that's the Swara to go to the mikveh every day. Now those who go every Shabbos, they're obviously not worried about Takana Ezra because they daven during the week without going to the mikveh. So there they go to the mikveh more for Kabbalistic reasons. That it is said that immersion in a mikveh is like going back to the womb and you're reborn, and since on Shabbos you're getting a new neshama. So part of what gets you a new neshama is the immersion in the mikvah because of the holiness of Shabbos. And at that point you then have gradations. Some say every Shabbos we want to experience that holiness. Uh, others will only do it on uh, Erev Yom Tif, and others, almost everybody, does it Erev Rosh Hashanah, Erev Yom Kippur, because that is connected to holiness, to rebirth, to purification, not Takana Ezra per se, but because of those other reasons. Uh, now, even then, although it's very, very true that uh, going to the mikveh, at least on Erev Yom Kippur for sure, is we would almost call it a quasi-obligation because almost everybody does it. Uh, strictly speaking, it, may, it is not an absolute obligation. And uh, some opinions say you can't fulfill it even with the shower uh, and the like. So. You should try to go, but if you're not able to, you know, it, uh, you will still have a kapara on Yom Kippur and Hashem will still accept your, your tshuva. But th those who do it every day, it's because of takanas, takanas Ezra. Yeah. <clears throat> so oftentimes people will, you know, say a certain halacha or will have a certain, you know, <clears throat> uh, thing we learn or whatever. And then some people say, oh, but I'll be Kabbalah, this, this, this or I'll be Hasidist, this, this, this. So why is it that we seem to downplay I'll be Kabbalah? Isn't Kabbalah the, the like deepest secrets of the Torah? And then kind of similarly with Hasidists, it's like some people dismiss Hasidists as like fluffy, or some people are like, oh, this is a Hasidish abort. And then they'll be <laughs> like, oh, like, oh, so I have to like, now I know how to like approach it. It's a little like take it lighter, not as seriously. But why not? Isn't it, isn't it just as canonical as Humash and, and Talmud? Like. Well, so, so, so here I think you do have to make a sharp difference between Kabbalah and Hasidus, although it's true sure. that much Hasidus is based on Kabbalah, but uh, Kabbalah is also separate from Hasidus. When you talk about Kabbalah, which we'll talk about the Zohar, talk about the Ari, that is more or less essentially canonical. 
not by everybody, but by and large, it's been accepted by Hasidim and Misnagdim that Kabbalah is a legitimate, deep part of the Torah, and you can't dismiss it, oh, that's only Kabbalah and the like. So when it comes to Kabbalah, it is interesting. You would assume, quite logically, that if Kabbalah says you're supposed to do something in something a certain way, and then Kabbalah are delving into Hashem and his will and his essence, and how he interacts with the universe, you would assume that what Kabbalah says about any the way to do any mitzvah would be enormously, enormously, enormously powerful. And that ought to be the almost the conclusive way. Uh, that makes a lot of sense, and yet Rav Moshe Feinstein, as well as other people before Rav Moshe, basically say that uh, Kabbalah uh, is not decisive and not determinative in the halachic process. In fact, Rav Moshe Feinstein says the Arizal, in addition to being a Makobal, is considered to be a bona fide posek, Baruch Hashem, but as a posek, he's a posek. He only counts as one vote. And as a result, if a majority of the poskim say different than the Ari, you don't have to follow the Ari because he's the Ari who knows Kabbalah. Now, logically, that is a hard, hard thing to understand because when I'm trying to keep halacha, I'm trying to kind of do what the will of God is, and the Ari is like, seems to you know, have an inside track in understanding that will. And yet, I think that what Rav Moshe is implicitly saying is, that many Kabbalistic rules were never intended for the average Jew. Many Kabbalistic rules were only intended for unique tzaddikim. And therefore, to say that I have to follow Kabbalah when I'm not on that madrega wouldn't necessarily be the case. And as a result, we do have this rule that uh, there's the halachic decision-making process, and then there's Kabbalah, and the Kabbalah is not machria, it does not necessarily decide what the halacha is. That seems to be the thinking of Rav Moshe and other people. Now, when it comes to Hasidus, though, you get into another level, and that is there are people who don't accept Hasidic teachings. Uh, they used to be called misnagdim, and they basically disagree with a lot of the premises of Hasidic teachings. And when they say they consider it fluff, it's because they, rightly or wrongly, <laughs> they consider it fluff. In other words, they do not consider Hasidic teachings to be canonical or authoritative in any way. Now, personally, I don't think that should be your hashkafa or my hashkafa. I think we should look at these great, great people as great tzaddikim with much insight. So I would, I would tend to move them into the direction of Kabbalah and kind of apply the same analysis. But there are those that would say Hasidus and Kabbalah are two different hierarchies. The Gra, for example, was certainly a great master of Kabbalah. I mean, you, people don't realize this. The Gra, the Vilna Gaon, who we know was the greatest halachic scholar, was even greater in Kabbalah than he was in, in halacha. The Vilna Gaon was primarily a mukubal, as strange as that sounds. So the Gra was certainly into Kabbalah, but the Gra was a very big opponent of certain deviations in the Hasidic movement. Uh, the Nefesh HaChayim, uh, to some degree, Rav Chaim Velazhner, a great sefer, is a critique of Hasidus. He doesn't mention Hasidus by name, but the unnamed opponent that he's addressing constantly uh, is the Hasidic movement. Uh, by the way, just as a general, just to be very superficial, the basic idea was that Hasidus emphasized very much the internal spiritual state, doing a mitzvah with enthusiasm, doing a mitzvah with love of Hashem, doing a mitzvah with fear of Hashem, learning Torah for the sake of serving God and connecting to God. And all of that is very, very beautiful. But as a result, Rav Chaim Voloshner pointed out, there were people who took the position, well, if you're not going to have the right fear of God or the right love of God, then your mitzvahs are worthless, and you might as well not do them. So Rav Chaim Voloshner writes the other way around. It's the doing that's the most important, and the kavana is a superimposed level on that. But even without the kavana, you've got to do the mitzvahs. Right, so that would be one example of a debate. Another example of a major debate, which again, controversial, is the nature of tzimtzum. Tzimtzum is the Arizal's teaching that in order for Hashem to create the world, he had to withdraw into himself to create an emptiness and a vacuum, and only then could something be created. Because if God is everywhere, how can I exist in the space that's occupied by God? So this is the idea of tzimtzum. Hashem had to shrink into himself in order to create. 
the Pashtas of the Vilna Gaon, I say Pashtas, so please do not send me an email that Avinom Frankel, okay, I, I, know, I know, I know he wrote a whole book on this. But the Pashtas, I, I do know. The Pashtas is that the Gra says Tzimtzum is quite literal. That God literally created a vacuum. I exist because God is not here. God is creating me, but God is not here because I'm here. That's called Tzimtzum Kipshuto, the simple meaning of Tzimtzum. The Balatanya considers that to be almost heretical. He says, how can there be any place where there is no God? And Tzimtzum, he therefore says, is a metaphor or a mushal, but it's not a true reality. Now, followers of the Vilna Gaon considered that to be pantheism. You're saying God is in me, I'm God, the rock is God, the table's God, everything's God. That's Avaita Zara. Right? So the Vilna Gaon would say on the Balatanya such a thing, and the Balatanya might say on the Vilna Gaon that you're denying the existence of God everywhere. Now that may sound like an arcane machlokas, but it was a huge, huge, huge machlokas. Again, to be clear, because I don't want to get an email on this, uh, there are those who are attempting to show that even the Vilna Gaon agrees with the Balatanya, and therefore Simpson Kipshuto has a different meaning, okay, and it's something worthy of studying. Uh, there's a fellow, uh, Rav Avinoam Frankel, who wrote a whole volume. He translated and annotated the Nefesh Achayim in volume one, and in volume two, he wrote Nefesh at Simpson, which analyzes this machlokis very thoroughly. So if you really want to be Ma'ayan, uh, this is the book to be Ma'ayan in. But still, Simpson was normally assumed to be a major, major machlokis. Uh, I'm digressing, but the point I want to make is that although I would say that Kabbalah has been accepted as a foundational aspect of Judaism, Hasidus had not always been accepted. Today it's much more so, but certainly 200 years ago it was not always accepted. Um, now, even Kabbalah, by the way, has not been accepted by everyone. Uh, there were uh, people who considered Kabbalah to be heretical because it talks about Hashem manifesting himself in different spheros, and that was said to be a disunity of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So there are even people who say Kabbalah is apikarsis, but uh, they are relatively few. In fact, mainstream religious Judaism, amazingly enough, is very Kabbalistically based. You, 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 you'd, be, you'd be quite amazed at it. You know, we're not Kabbalists. We don't learn Kabbalah that much. But things that we do all the time are really based on ideas of, of Kabbalah. So Kabbalah has kind of become the mainstream theology of Judaism today. Yeah. Well, the, the big issue is this, and maybe Ashkenazim have it worse than Sephardim, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. And that is, uh, the atmosphere in Europe, if you would be in a Litvish yeshiva, let's say, 100 years ago, or whatever it is, and even I remember when I was in yeshiva, you know, uh, Elul was kind of a terror-stricken time, a time of fear, a time of guilt, a time that every single day, every single minute, there was this notion, God is going to be judging you for your life. And now you only have three weeks left, two weeks left. Now it's only a few days left. The last days are coming. Uh, this is the last Wednesday, the last Thursday of the year. And, you know, this is your last chance to fix all the Averis you did on Thursday. You know, Yom Chamish, Yom Revi, whatever it was. And here's the thing. All of that is very true. I mean, God forbid, nobody can deny that God judges on Rosh Hashanah if we're entitled to live for another year. Who will live, who will die? People died over this past year, and we have to remember, COVID or otherwise, and we have to remember that that was decided, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. So this is a very serious thing, and we have to take it seriously, and uh, we have to do what we need to do. But the problem is, when it becomes abject terror, it turns into depression, it turns into panic, it turns into anxiety. 
It turns into negativity. It turns into self-loathing. And that, in turn, leads to yish. Yish is despondency and hopelessness. Now, the problem is, these are not emotions that are conducive to spiritual growth. If my image of God is, he's out to get me. He's going to look, right? Scrutinize. He's going to look and look and look and look and look. Well, you know, when you look, you're fine, right? So no matter what I do, God is going to find something to stick me with. And indeed, I, I believe that that is the common attitude that maybe unintentionally is conveyed in a lot of the uh, yeshiva world, that Elul, God is going to stick it to you, whether you like it or not. And therefore, you, know, you do your best, but you know, there's no way. There's no way. So the problem is that in an earlier, maybe in earlier generations where people were stronger and they could take criticism and they had a certain toughness, they could look at this as a challenge. I'm going to, you know, not beat God, but I'm going to show God that I can do it. In our generation, we tend to give up very easily. So because of this, the Bali Musr have said that we need to focus not only on the negatives, not only on the judgment, but on Hashem's love and Hashem's acceptance. And the fact that, as I said earlier about Tinoch Shanishba, that, you know, if we try to be better, that counts for a lot, even if we're not perfect. And even with our failures, Hashem is looking at our overall orientation. And that's simply needed because that gives me the chizuk to try to become a better person. When I know I have a chance, when I know that I can look good in the eyes of Hashem, that gives me a desire to try to do that. Now, one way of looking at Rosh Hashanah, it's interesting to use a business metaphor. Uh, there's a, uh, an abbreviation in business called ROI, which means return on investment. Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of the fiscal year of the universe because Hashem created Adam on Rosh Hashanah. At the beginning of the fiscal year, Hashem has to decide whether the investment is worth it. Is God getting a return on his investment? After all, he invests a lot in all of us. You know, it's a, is it a reasonable investment or not? Right? So Hashem looks at the past as a predictor of what the investment's going to be. So at some point, Hashem might decide, hey, this investment isn't going very well. I'm going to cut my losses. Right? Uh, other times, even if the stock, imagine a stock. The stock isn't doing so well. But the wise investor sees there's a potential here. He may say, I'm going to hold on to this a little longer because maybe there's a potential. So what we have to do is we got to try to make our case to Hashem that I'm a good investment. Yeah, maybe I'm not yielding the highest dividends, but you know, there's potential for growth here. And I think that takes away some of the anxiety of Elo, some of the fear of Elo, so you can experience the joy of Elo and Rosh Hashanah and of course Yom Kippur, which is the happiest day of the, of, of the year. Okay, so that's why the emphasis changes generally. You know, even in terms of Musr Svarim, you know, one of the famous Musr Svarim that was written in the time of the Arizo, it's a classic Musr Sefer, and it's still around, it's on the shelf, is called the Reishis Chachma. The Reishis Chachma was written by a great Makobol, who was a Talmud of the Arizo. And the Reishis Chachma is filled with graphic descriptions of Gehenim, of torture and suffering, in fact, a whole section of the book is called Maseches Gehedim. And people used to learn that a lot. And uh, that would inspire them, that would motivate them, and the like. But today, the, uh, a normal mashkiach would tell a Talmud not even, uh, not even to look at such a safer. Because if, it all, if all it does is terrorize us, so one, one of two things happen. Either we get devastated, or we tune out and become indifferent. Because I mean, I'm not going to let myself you know, get pulled into that. Either way is no good. In other words, if you're paralyzed with despair or you're bored with indifference, both of those are very useless, not helpful emotions. So as a result, we, 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 we soft pedal it a little bit by emphasizing the aspect of divine love. Now, that's not a lie. Now, okay, maybe I shouldn't mention names, although, although he mentions names. You know, many of you might have heard of Rav Yosef Mizrahi, who's a very, very popular lecturer. And again, I'm, I'm not going to criticize him. All I'm going to note is that he does have a very, very hard line approach 
in which he'll talk a lot about Gehenna, and he'll talk a lot about suffering, he'll talk a lot about how God will torture you uh, if you do this Avera or that Avera. And he's very critical of rabbis, maybe including me, uh, although I did not make his enemies list, I feel offended a little bit, uh, but, but uh, who said, oh, you soft pedal things, you, uh, you make things, everything sweet and nice, when that's not the reality. The reality is, there are these awful, awful, awful punishments, and you're just trying to pander to your audience. I mean, that, that's kind of his approach. Again, I, I'm not here to critique. I, I'm just, I, I'm describing, and I believe my description is 100% accurate in that way. But what I would say to that is, everything is right, meaning all of this is true. There is punishment, there's accountability, there's love, and there's compassion, and there's mercy. This is not one is right and one is wrong. The question becomes, in the totality of a picture, what are the elements that are most likely to motivate me to move in a positive direction? So, I don't think this is distortion. I'm like, like everything else, in the totality of Torah, there are many, many different aspects. And the question is, we have to look at the aspects that help me move forward. And I think that in our generation, the, the positive aspects just help me more than too much of an emphasis on the negatives. Yeah? There's a send in. <clears throat> Academic as well as modern Orthodox commentators of Torah often cite the Septuagint. Mm. Is that source ever relevant to us since it's not part of our Masora? Would this also apply to the Dead Sea Scrolls? Yeah, a uh, very excellent question. So again, Septuagint uh, is actually discussed in the Gemara itself. This is the famous story of Talmai HaMelech, King Talmai, who was a successor of Alexander in uh, Egypt. Uh, because Alexander uh, had no children, so his empire was divided. So Talmai's library in Alexandria was like the uh, Library of Congress. He wanted to have a copy of every book that existed in the ancient civilization. And he commissioned 70 elders of our Chachamim to translate the Torah into Greek. Right? This is a Gemara Megillah. And the Gemara Megillah says that even though they were put in different rooms, they came up with the exact same translation. That's a nace. Although somebody once said, kind of a joke, if they would have been working in the same room and they would have come up with the same translation, that would be a bigger miracle. Uh, because people, people fight and, and argue. Okay, now that is what is called the Septuagint. Septuagint is just Latin for the translation of the 70 elders. Right, so the Septuagint is mentioned in the Gemara. Uh, so Chazal were certainly aware of it, but you are correct that it was not considered part of the Masorah of Torah Shabal Peh, uh, and therefore as a result we generally do not use it to determine the meaning of Psukim. The Septuagint has been much more important in Christianity than in Judaism for the following reasons. Although uh, the early church fathers, most of them knew Hebrew, but a lot of the, some of them didn't, and they actually learned the Torah from the Septuagint. They, 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 they understood the Torah of Hashem from the Septuagint. In the community of Alexandria, which was a very assimilated Jewish community, they also learned the Torah from the Septuagint. Even Philo of Alexandria, who was a Jewish man and probably somewhat religious. Some say he didn't know Hebrew, and he wrote commentaries on the Torah, but it's based in Greek, which is based on the Septuagint. So the Septuagint itself uh, is not considered to be authoritative, uh, although for the most part it is not keneged halacha. So for the most part, you know, you can look at it and there'll be nothing wrong that you're going to see. Although there's one big exception about abortion, maybe I'll mention. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls is a very, very different mitzvah. The Septuagint were written by what we would call rabbis. We would call them the Chachamim. We don't have their names, but Chazal seem to identify them as Zikanim, which is a term for legitimate teachers of the Torah Shebichsav and the Torah Shebaal Peh. The Dead Sea Scrolls is a very, very different type of composition. These came from groups that deliberately broke away from the mainstream of Klal Yisrael to form separate enclaves. Some of them were called the Essenes. Uh, again, these were like hermits uh, who took on things like celibacy. 
common ownership of property. They were very into purity. They went to the mikvah all the time, but, but uh, they didn't accept. In fact, they thought the Chachamim were corrupt. They thought the temple was corrupt. They wanted to create like their own temple rituals. And as a result, uh, much of the Dead Sea Scrolls does contain, much, not all, things that are apikorsis, things that are kineget, the teachings of our sages, and the like. So uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls is much more, uh, or much less legitimate than perhaps the Septuagint would be. Now, as a matter of academic scholarship, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls are extraordinarily interesting in terms of what did these different sects believe, but they were not mainstream Judaism. They were breakaways uh, from Judaism, and they represented minority uh, groups who did not accept the Torah, Shabal, Peh, and, and the like. So there is a difference there. The Septuagint was written by people who were Maimon in Torah, Shabal, Peh, the Dead Sea Scrolls were not. That's the difference. Now, I do want to mention, although maybe maybe take me a little far afield, one outstanding example, though, of the Septuagint recording a Messiah, a Shita of Chazal, that does not appear in the Gemara at all. Like, it's kind of a lost Shita. And uh, this may have been the basis of why the Catholic Church took such a strong uh, uh, anti-abortion position based on the Septuagint. The Torah says in Parshas Mishpatim, that if uh, two people are fighting and a pregnant woman tries to stop uh, the fight and she gets punched in the belly and miscarriage, uh, miscarries, so it says that uh, the one that punched her has to pay compensation to the husband. And that is one of the sources that abortion is not murder. Because if it would be murder, there would be a capital crime. It wouldn't be financial. But then it says that's only if there's no asson, if there's no calamity. If there's no calamity, there's compensation. If there's a calamity, there is no compensation because there's death. How do Chazal understand calamity? They understand it if the woman got killed, meaning if there's no asson and the only thing is the miscarriage, financial. If there's asson, the woman got killed, then it's death penalty. That's how Chazal understand it, based on the idea that abortion is never murder. Abortion is a financial crime. It's only killing the mother that's murder. But the Septuagint has a different translation of ason. They don't translate ason as calamity, but they connect it to the Greek word soma, which means formation of body. And what it's saying is, if the fetus does not yet have recognized arms and legs, then it's financial. Once the fetus has recognized arms and legs, it's murder. In other words, the Septuagint is actually being machmir and treating the killing of a baby with formed arms and legs as an act of homicide. Now, that is not a shita in Chazal. That's not in the Gemara at all. And apparently, the Chachamim of the Septuagint, they had a certain Messiah that did not find its way in the halachic process but it was a shita that some chachamim held. So that, I think, is an outstanding, unusual example of the Septuagint actually creating a halacha that we don't follow, but that would be very, very different than that which, which is recorded. Okay? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is the this is the biggie. Uh, this is a real, real difficult problem. Uh, the Rambam in Perek Beis of Hilchis Tshuva tells us what is Tshuva that you regret what you did, and you've decided you're not going to do the sin again. And God in heaven, who knows the secret recesses of your heart, can testify, or you make God your witness, that you will never return to this sin again. Now, if you think about this, we think about the things we've done shuva for, Lush and Hara, whatever it is. Is the Rambam saying, my shuva is not shuva unless I never go back to this sin again. If I do shuva on Lush and Hara, 
and in the rest of the year, the next year, I'm going to speak some Lashon Hara. It's not only the sin of the new Lashon Hara I spoke, I don't get forgiveness for all the old sins. If you take the Rambam very literally, that's a devastating result. It turns out that, I mean, okay, there may be some of theirs. If I decide to be a Shomer Shabbos, so it could be I'll never violate, even then I'll probably violate Shabbos. Okay, I won't detraif. But for Averis, like Midos, like Lashon Hara, where we're always going to be Nikshal, right? So how can you fulfill Tshuva according to the Rambam? So one answer is, although it doesn't fit the words as good as uh, you would like, when the Rambam says, you will never return to the sin again, he doesn't mean you'll never do the sin again. You might do the sin again but you're not going to be in the same place, meaning you're a little different. If, if for example, this year you spoke Lashon Hara for 40 hours, next year you'll cut it down to 39 and a half. In other words, you're not going to return to the same place. You've made some progress. So the Rambam is saying, if you've made no progress at all, then Einachinami, you haven't done Shuvah yet. Okay, got to keep trying. But the Rambam doesn't mean it has to be perfect. But he means you're not dragged down to the same place. That's one thing. A second interpretation of the Rambam is that Hashem's judgment is based on your state of mind at the time of your tshuva. In other words, when it says, God testifies, you will never do the sin again, that doesn't mean God is looking into the future. Rather, God is saying, based on how you feel now, you would never do the sin again. But Einachinami, unfortunately, the Sahara comes at various times. You see the point, in other words, the point according to this is not referring to your actual behavior as it gets manifest, it's referring to your state of mind in this particular moment of time. That your decision has to be so strong that you truly do not want to do this sin again. This is a pshat, uh, they, they say from, um, Rabbi Yitzhak Blaser, Rabbi Yitzhak Lepetzer, Rabbi Yitzhak Salanter's great Talmud. Rabbi Yitzhak Salanter had a number of great Talmudim. Uh, one of the greatest was Rabbi Yitzhak Blaser. And for a short amount of time, Rabbi Yitzhak Blaser was the chief rabbi of Petersburg in Russia, which was the Tsarist capital. So he's known in Yiddish as Rav Itzala Mi Petterberger. Rav Itzala of Petterberg, that's Rabbi Yitzhak Blaser. And uh, he was the one who put together of his Osmanter Sefer, Orly Israel, which is the one Sefer we have of him. And uh, in that Sefer, he also has some essays of his own in the introduction. And this is one of the things that he says. So there are different ways of understanding the Rambam, but Eino Hanami, you're 100% right. A literal reading of the Rambam would almost render tshuva impossible in many cases. And that's certainly not HaKadosh Baruch Hu's intention. Yeah? Um, speaking of abortion, you yeah. mentioned that not considered murder. So, what are so, so let, let, me, let me explain that a little bit because again, I, I'm so afraid of getting emails that I have to hedge everything. When I say it's not considered murder, I, I just mean it in a very narrow sense that it is not a capital crime, meaning a Jew who kills a fetus is not put to death for that crime, which he might be if he killed a born human being. So in that sense, abortion does not have the punishment of murder. Now, whether it's spiritually murder in Hashem's book, that already is a machlokas. I'm not, I'm not addressing that particular issue. But it is pashat that, you, that even when there's a Sanhedrin that can put you to death, and even if there is warning, and even if there's witnesses, you do not get killed for performing an abortion. As opposed to the Septuagint that actually says you would, if the arms and legs were formed. Now, I'm sorry, so with that little introduction, what was your question? Uh, what are cases where you would, would allowed to... Uh... Oh, so the question where you're allowed to abort, uh, the classic case is where the mother's life is in danger, where the pregnancy uh, or the birth could result in her death. So the halacha is that the mother's life has priority over the fetus's life. But even that is only as long as the fetus is unborn. Once it's stuck its head out, once the head comes out, it's halachically born. Once it's born, you cannot kill the baby to save the mother. You can kill the fetus to save the mother. You cannot kill the baby to save the mother. Now, when we say 
that if the mother's life is in danger, you can abort, it's not only physical danger. Let's say, for example, there was a rape or an incest, and the mother is so traumatized that if she has to carry the baby, there's a very severe risk she'll commit suicide. That might be a situation that's also called the mother's life is in danger and we might be allowed to abort. So halacha recognizes psychological trauma as potentially a life-threatening. Okay? Uh, yeah? To what extent is the individual responsible for his or her actions if their actions are a consequence of mental illness? How would this influence one's neshama in the world to come and the concept of teshuva? Yeah, uh, this is, a, a, again, a very, very difficult issue. Obviously, uh, when Hashem evaluates our actions, our deeds, our motivations, our mental and emotional state are obviously major factors to be taken into account. Uh, whether or not mental illness is a total exoneration and a total excuse depends on a lot of things. It depends on the severity of the mental illness. It depends on the ability to control. It depends on the various choices that a person is able to make. You know, there's a mental illness that might be mild depression, and then there's a mental illness that is an acute uh, psychiatric breakdown, psychosis and the like, and they would be judged in different ways. Uh, there is a category in halacha called the shota, who is mentally incompetent, where halacha basically says he's not responsible for his actions in, in any way. But here is a concept that Rev Dessler developed that's a very, very uh, important concept. It connects to our discussion on free will. And he says, there's always a point in your life that's called nekudat habachira. Nekudat habachira means the fulcrum point, meaning like this. If you're a drug addict lying in a gutter, God is not going to say, why aren't you in kolel right now? I'm going to punish you because you're not in kolel learning uh, you know, 10 blad of Gemara a day. Now, you can't expect that of a guy that's lying in the gutter because of cocaine. So what does Hashem expect of this drug addict that is in the throes of an addiction? Hashem does not expect him to be in kolel. But Hashem says, you could make a choice to go to treatment. Meaning, there's a certain choice you can make. Now, the choices then branch out. As you get higher and higher and higher, your choices branch out in different ways. But Hashem holds you accountable for the choice you could have made at that given moment in your life. Now, there are going to be some cases of mental illness where you literally didn't have that capacity of choice. And you're not going to be responsible for that. But in many, many cases, there always is some choice you could make at that point, And Hashem is going to hold you accountable. So the bottom line is that you will not necessarily be held accountable because you failed to do the best thing, you, the best thing, but you're held accountable because there was something you could have done to make the situation a little, a little better. Uh, you could have checked into the outpatient treatment. You could have gone to a methadone clinic. Uh, you could have gone to a friend to take care of you. There are things you could have done and you could have made the choice not to stay where you are at this point. But, what, I mean, again, there's, there is no question that mental illness is going to be a major, major factor in God's judgment. But how it plays out, only Hashem knows what you could have done with what you were given. Okay, so it's a, it's a hard question, yeah. What's the history of the black kippa being the mainstream <laughs> yeshivish, yeshivish kippa? And um, is there a difference or meaning behind the ring at the bottom of some? And like the, you'll see, like some black kippas have like a gray ring around the edge. Maybe that's just a design thing, or if there's meaning. Or some are all black, for example. Hmm. Um, well, I don't really know the history of the ring. I, I, I have to I have to check that out. Maybe it was some kid decided to be rebellious uh, in his uh, Haredi family. <laughs> what ring? That sounds a little avant-garde to me, but okay. Uh, so. The history of black being, uh, being the kind of the official garment is not that old, really. It's not that old. Uh, if you look at pictures of people like Ruf Steinman uh, in yeshivas in Europe, you know, they wore uh, colored garments, uh, blue shirts, for example, different, the lighter, lighter suits. I mean, I remember when I was in Nair Yisrael, um, I saw, I, I mean, 
the things I, I the things I wore. I mean, I, I would not I would not be caught dead wearing them now. I guess I can't you know I can't believe what people wore in yeshivas in the 1970s, even in regular black hat Haredi yeshivas, as well, some people don't consider it a Haredi yeshiva, but let, let's uh, let's assume for purposes of illustration that, that that it is, and the like. So the notion of black, 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 white, etc., is fairly recent. Uh, it might be almost a post-Holocaust situation, where as society gets more and more pre-Zistic, so we get more and more conservative, and we have to dress a certain way because we want to disassociate ourselves, and therefore black is austere, black is simple, black is non-dramatic, and therefore we don't want to get into fashions and the like. So although it's become a fashion, but technically it was based on indifference to fashion. That was the, that was the basic idea. Now one thing about the Yarmulkes, though, that is worthy of note, because there's a halakhic implication. And that is uh, the Yarmulke has a lining. That's very significant, the notion of a lining. Uh, and that's because it is brought down that one should, in the Zohar, that one should have a double head covering. So a hat and a yarmulke. So some say the lining of a yarmulke might be a double covering. So even when you're not wearing a hat, you're still makayim, the Indian of the Zohar. Unlike the kippah ruga, which does not have a lining, right? So that's why kippah rugas might be puzzle, because, I mean, not really puzzle, but uh, that's why the, they're not makayim, the heater of the Zohar, to have a double kisoy harosh when you're learning Torah or being maskashem shemayim. I will tell you the Kippah Shruga is recent. There actually is a history of Kippah Shruga. And this was, uh, I think it goes back like to the 1940s. And what happened was, you had the pioneering Rosh Yeshiva who were trying to work with Israeli youth, many of whom were secular and Zionist. And these were kids who wore shorts and all sorts of things. And the rabbis were trying to get them to wear kippot. But the kids didn't want to wear the kippahs because they associated kippahs with the Haredim, who were too strict and rejecting. So the Zionist movement had to invent a kippah that was different than the Haredi kippah so that the Zionist kids who were not religious would not uh, be afraid of wearing it. So the kippahs ruga was actually a response to get Zionist non-religious kids to wear yarmulkes by giving them a uniform that was different and distinct. So, so the truth is, when Haredim sometimes attack you for wearing a kippah suruga, hey, you know, you're affiliating with the movement, and you say, no, I'm just wearing a yarmulke, which of course is true. But historically, there's a little bit of substantiation to that claim, because the kippah suruga was invented to disassociate Zionist kids from Haredim. Again, for good purposes. The Rebbeim did, didn't do it to create separation. They did it as a Kirov technique because the kids refused to wear something that was the same as the Haredi uniform. Yeah. Um, you see Parsha and also, like, so many times in the Torah, the Torah talks so much about idolatry and um, focuses so much on it. And um, Moshe gives, obviously, so much muster to the Jews not to do it. And um, Hashem knew that Idolatry wasn't going to really be so prevalent that way. I knew that 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 it's a hard for idolatry to take it to be taken away. So I think also that like like I know people when they read the Arayos, how a lot of the the family uh, relationships that the Torah forbids. Also, I should knew that these things were going to be attracting my like, I'm, I'm, I guess it could be a very like, Kabbalistic like symbolism. Uh, people, like, people, uh, why did Hashem? Why did Torah? Yeah, so the question that you're asking is that the Torah spends a great deal of time uh, condemning uh, sins that tended to fade away with time. So, for example, uh, we no longer have the Yetzir Hara for idolatry. It says that the Chachamim fasted for three days and that Yetzir Hara was taken away. And incest, the Torah spends a lot of time on incest prohibitions and how bad incest uh, was. And Baruch Hashem, I mean, although there are uh, deviants even today, but you know, by and large, incest is not a major, major problem in terms of numbers of people uh, that are practicing it. And the, the question is that even if we're going to say that in the ancient world, incest was common, idolatry was common, but the Torah has to have an eternal aspect. The Torah is not, was not written 
for a particular generation. The Torah was written as an eternal repository of truth. So why is it stressing those aspects of misbehavior that we would call ephemeral, temporary things that are going to, are going to pass? Uh, it, is, it is a very good question. Uh, but the, sh I mean, the short answer would be that idolatry is also a symbolic idea. In other words, idolatry can take many, many forms. Uh, at one point in human civilization, it took the forms of statues and icons. And even today, you have Buddhism and some parts of Christianity. Even that part is still around. But there can be the new idolatry. A person can worship money, worship power, uh, worship uh, the ability to control people, economic and political systems. Right? So when the Torah says, keep away from the idols, it refers to all of the things that a person considers to be the central principle of their life other than serving God and following God's Torah. You can have self-idolatry. You can make yourself a God, looking after number one. The most important thing in my life is to take care of me. Well, that happens to be Avodah Zarah, right? <laughs> that to look at yourself as the most important thing uh, in the universe. So as a result, uh, the Torah is both. This is a point Rav Lichtenstein make, made, made a lot of times. The Torah uses the vocabulary that was shayach to that generation. It used the words that were familiar to the door of Matan Torah. But the fundamental truths of the Torah are not historically contingent, meaning they do represent eternal ideas. Same thing with incest. Uh, granted, uh, most people are not going to sexually molest their sisters or their mothers, right? So that particular Aver is not going to happen. But the notion of taiva, the notion of boundaries, the notion of holding yourself back, the notion of don't do whatever you can do just because you can do it, right? Those are lessons that we have to absorb. So the, the Torah is using examples that may have been prevalent at the time, but that does not change the fundamental truth. In fact, it's interesting on Yom Kippur, I want to mention a little word about Yom Kippur. In the morning, we read Parsha Sachari Mos, which is the Yom Kippur service of the Kohen Gadol in the Kodesh Akdashim. Makes sense, right? The Yom Kippur service is the Kriya Satira of Yom Kippur morning. Yom Kippur Mincha, we read a list of forbidden sexual relations. Don't be with your mother, don't be with your sister, don't be with your dog, bestiality, all of these different things. Now, why are we reading about that in Yom Kippur? Is, is, that, is that kind of thing I need to do tshuva for? I mean, uh, is that my Avera? I certainly hope not, right? So what's going on? So the simple Balabat Deshe answer is, well, you're just continuing the Parsha. Right after the Yom Kippur Aveda is the Arayas. But you could ask Akasha, why does the Torah write it that way? I think there's a profound idea here. Because on Yom Kippur, one of the things, one of the Averis we could fall prey to on Yom Kippur is maybe a certain smugness. Because we've been fasting, we've been davening, We've been doing tshuva. I'm righteous. I'm holy. I'm pure. I'm not going to do low, base sin. And yet we read on Yom Kippur, don't, you know, don't commit incest. Don't commit bestiality. It's a reminder. A person should never be so overconfident in their righteousness that they think they can't fall all the way to the bottom. It's a reality check. We think We've reached such a level of purity, and maybe we have, but we need a reality warning that we could easily fail again. And unfortunately, uh, I mean, without getting into specifics, I mean, we, we've seen over the years that sometimes, sometimes there are even rabbis uh, that cross boundaries and you know, bad things can happen. So uh, the fact that you're learned and uh, you're righteous, see, this is why you know, yichud and all of these rules, you know, you don't have yichud with a woman, you don't uh, hold her hand, you don't kiss her. Like people say, what's wrong with that? Are we like, are we like sexual predators? I mean, I, I can't like uh, take a woman, I'm talking to a woman trying to give her chizik, I can't take her hand, a touch, it's such a nice thing. What are you afraid of? But the truth of the matter is, you know, once you cross boundaries, even if it's innocuous, it seems to be a relatively minor thing. Things can happen faster than you could imagine. 
And therefore the Torah is basically saying it's better to have boundaries than to put yourself in situations that can go out of control very, very quickly. And we've seen it. We've actually seen it in life. That there are people sometimes, and it's understandable, they, they consider themselves so righteous that they say, you know, I can, I can hold this woman's hand and nothing's going to happen. And a person makes a chashvim like that. What are you telling me? And then what happens is things happen. Shlomo HaMelech made that mistake. The Torah says the king cannot have a lot of wives, no more than 18, lest he become distracted and his heart be taken away from Hashem. Shlomo HaMelech said, not going to happen to me. I'm the smartest guy in the world. And what happened is he thought the Torah doesn't apply to him and he had so many women. And what happened was exactly what the Torah said. It, it uh, took him away from Hashem. And that's why the Torah doesn't like to give reasons. Because if the Torah gives reasons, people are going to say, oh, that doesn't apply to me. The truth is it does apply to you, but you think it doesn't. So Hashem says, okay, I'm not giving you a reason. Just do it. Because when you start getting a reason, then people start arguing and thinking it doesn't apply to them, etc. Okay? Anything else? Uh, yeah. Um, you know among those who do accept chassizus as like, Okay, learning, learning, time, everything. Um, I can see this is great, it's accepted. Um, even among some of those, um, there are those, including Sonia Graham, who said that maybe the teachings of the Nahum and rest of them are not necessarily applicable to Al Qaisal in his time and afterwards. And I was wondering how we could experiment. Yeah, yeah, uh, it is very true that uh, Rav Nachman of Breslov, who, by the way, was a great grandson of the Baal Shem Tov himself, Rav Nachman of Breslov uh, was very, very, was, not only is, was very controversial, even among the Hasidic uh, Rebbeim of the time. But of course, the Baal Tanya was also controversial, so controversy doesn't automatically uh, mean there's a problem. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, some say, even today, that even if you learn Hasidus, like Svas Emes, uh, Shei Mishmuel, Rav Tzadok, which is very deep, but Rav Tzadok is certainly Mekobol in the yeshiva world, although he's very, very difficult, but those things are fine, even Tanya might be okay, uh, but Rav Nachman Breslov, uh, too much, too much a little bit. Uh, well, all I can say is that, yes, but, but I think the bigger problem that people have with Breslov is not Rav Nachman's teachings, it's the behavior of some of the fringe elements of Breslov, the Nanach stuff, and uh, the dancing in the street and dancing on top of cars. Uh, now that's not from Rav Nachman. That's not from Rav Nachman. Rav Nachman doesn't say Nanach. That's not from Rav Nachman at all. So I think if, if people are trying to steer you or anybody away from Breslov, I, I don't think it's Lakute Maran per se that they're talking about. I think they're talking about some of the behaviors which again, I, I don't want to criticize that either, but, but some will regard them as not appropriate behaviors. Uh, for a Ben Torah and the like. So they'll use Rav Nachman's books as the whipping boy, kind of say, oh, you know, Rav Nachman was controversial even then. But, but essentially, I don't, I don't think it's Rav Nachman they're talking about. They're talking about the behaviors. You know, if any of you have had these chus to meet like an older Breslaber, like a Breslaber, you, you see they're, they're very extraordinary people. They're great, great, great tzaddikim. And they radiate simcha but it's a dignified simcha. It's not the simcha of you know, uh, the crazy craziness, which may have its place too, but, but it's, a, it's a very dignified simcha. And uh, sometimes, you know, you really, uh, it's, it's very attractive. It's Moshe Chesalev. You're with someone like that, and you say, wow, he has a connection to Hashem, and there's such a joy in his mitzvahs. So there is something uh, very, very beautiful and very, very moving about, uh, about as many aspects of Breslau. But you've got to avoid. I mean, Uman is a good example. I understand that uh, they're planning on going to Uman, right? That, that's right. I think everyone's still going. Wow. That's uh, pretty amazing. Um, so uh, Uman and Rosh Hashanah, there's a lot of stuff on YouTube videos. You look at the videos, you know, it looks like Woodstock uh, with scissors. I mean, uh, wild, hefkeris, somersaults, crazy stuff, rock music. So you look at it and you say, well, what is this? This is, this is just a shtick. This is just a game. But I will tell you, I will tell you. I, I know people that I respect, you know, B'nai Torah, I didn't necessarily agree with their decision, but they went to Uman for Rosh Hashanah, and they said that they had spiritual deep transformations. So apparently there, there, there are two things going on at the same time. There's the carnival aspect, there's the showmanship aspect, there's the Woodstock aspect, which, as I say, you know, what do you need it? You know, what, what does that do? 
But there is some very deep core of ruchnius and spirituality that's there as well. The problem is, can you get one without getting connected to the other? That, that's, that's kind of the issue people have with Reza. Yeah? I've been someone saying leaving Eretz Yisrael to Uman to find the Spirit. Yeah, yeah that's, that, that is another problem. That even if Uman is great and Uman is gewaldic, uh, what do you say? <laughs> oh, I'm going to leave Yerushalayim uh, where we pray for you know, uh, hundreds of years, thousands of years to be able to come back to Yerushalayim. I'm going to leave it to go to the Ukraine uh, because that's where I'll really experience uh, Rosh Hashanah. It is a real, it is a real problem. It, it is a problem. That much is a problem. If somebody wants to go to Oman, like for a regular Shabbos or whatever it will be, that's one thing. Now the truth is, on one hand, Rav Nachman did tell his followers before his death that come to me for Rosh Hashanah. It's a very special thing. But I believe, I don't know why, that Rav Nachman himself said, you should never leave Eretz Yisrael for this. I, I, I believe Rav Nachman himself said such a davar that Eretz Yisrael is is more significant. It's amazing that, maybe I should be sure that there is such a quote, but I, I think I actually saw such a mimer. So that, that is a real, that is a real problem. Yeah. These days, it's said that, uh, about free will, that Hashem doesn't reveal himself openly to us yet, uh, because that would affect our free will to choose whether to serve him or not, essentially. Uh, but across all of Humash, Hashem was revealing himself to him everyone left and right. Did they have free will? Why is that different from now? Yeah, well, that's an interesting point. You know, people say, oh, if Hashem would reveal himself, uh, we would never have the free will to commit a sin. Well, what about the Chet Ego coming after Matan Torah and Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim? Uh, what about every, every Chet in the Dor HaMidbar uh, came in a context of extreme, open, divine revelation and the like. So there's an interesting idea here. Uh, it says in Kohelas, Zel Lukim. Hashem creates a certain balance in the world, meaning the stronger your spiritual kochos are, the greater is your yetzer hara. So the concept was this. The Dor HaMidbar reached such a high level of divine perception that their stubbornness and rebelliousness grew in proportion to the Hasaga that they had. So they were capable of rebelling against Hashem no matter what Hashem showed them. That's almost a testimony to their greatness. We are weaker. So frankly, if God would give everything away, we would just crumble like a bunch of cards. We're not strong enough to rebel against God. Had we seen the whole picture. So Hashem says, listen, I want you to have free will, so I can't show you everything. If I showed you everything, you would just surrender. You're not tough enough. Even though it would be good to surrender, in a sense. So in a sense, the rebelliousness of the Dora Midbar is on some level a testimony to an extraordinary spiritual strength which needed to be countermanded by a capacity to rebel at the same, at the same time. Right? So but that might be one, one approach to it. Yeah. Um, regarding Chorez, um, in previous year, I've heard, um, I've heard Rebbe um, say, I believe it was Vesler saying that even if like, something is a very nice thing to do, um, you, um, well, you only have a certain amount of spiritual energy. You don't want to use too much of that in one place. And I'm just wondering, um, for certain things that are just like, like that, in the Shoah, quoted in Chassidus or Chumrah, um, things that are super, super easy, like, for example, wearing keep them asleep or wearing a bigger size of tzitzis that will fill all the shit in the up, that's easy for someone. Um, you want to say that that could still be taking with spiritual energy or it's just a very easy thing to do? Well, well uh, you're 100% correct. If something is relatively easy, then it would be a good thing to incorporate <laughs> it because it's not depleting your energy. But the problem is, here's the interesting problem. The problem is that psychological energy can be spent even if there's no physical exertion. Meaning if you find yourself thinking about, gee, is my tzitzah big enough? Is my yarmulke, you know, you, you can find yourself obsessed with a certain aspect. And when Rav Dester talks about depleting spiritual energy, he's also including uh, obsessions and preoccupations which kind of take you away from the big picture. And in some ways, it's easier to think about those little things than to think about the big things. So we often use the little things. We comfort ourselves that we're so righteous that we're thinking about these little things. And in that way, it's a diversionary tactic not to think about the, the big things. So 
even things that are easy, I think there may be some issue that you need to think about as, as well. Yeah. Um, according to just on the last one, I guess maybe I have to give Hashkaf Leeway things as well. What is a woman really required to cover uh, in regards to smooth? You're talking about uh, just generally? Generally. Yeah, so again, I mean, uh, there are going to be different, different sheets just about this. Uh, the basic idea is that she, okay, she has to cover what is called her shok, shok. Now, there's a huge machlokas. What is shok? Is shok the upper leg or is shok the lower leg? If shok is the upper leg, that means she has to wear a skirt that covers her knee, but the lower leg can be exposed even without stockings. Right, so that's the lenient shita, that shok is the thigh, and therefore the thigh goes until the knee and includes the kneecap. Uh, there is another shita that's more machmir, that looks at shok as the lower leg, and that would actually require a dress that goes down up to the ankles itself. Right, so those are two shitas regarding the leg. By the way, if you think about this, either way, stockings, l'chaira, are not relevant because we manashach. If I hold that the lower leg has to be covered, stockings aren't going to count because they're skin, skin tight. If I hold the lower leg doesn't have to be covered, I don't need stockings. So l'chaira, either stockings are insufficient or they're unnecessary. Nevertheless, there are minhagim that are also superimposed. In other words, remember, tzniyas has a minimum requirement, but you also have to follow the minhagim of the community that you're in if they're going beyond it. In terms of arms, so we paskin the elbows have to be covered, but the lower arm up until the elbow, miyikaradin, does not have to be covered. Uh, in terms of the uh, neck, so uh, that's a big machlokas. Uh, certainly at the point of the cleavage where the breasts begin to show, that has to be covered. But what about the collarbone? What if the collar is above the breast line, but you're showing the collarbone? Again, machlokas, machlokas, right? So uh, there are going to be different shitas about, about that. So basically, we paskin, cover the knee, cover the elbow, cover the cleavage point, and uh, collarbone, and below the knee, and uh, the lower arm are machloksim, and it may depend on various minhagim. Uh, if the woman is a married woman, so she must uh, cover her hair when she appears in public, when she is in the privacy of her home, uh, even if her husband or children are there, me iker adin, she does not have to cover her hair, but uh, many righteous women are machmer to cover their hair even then. Uh, that is a chumra, but it is not a requirement of the halacha. Rav Moshe has a big chiddish, a very big chiddish, and to go over the sources would be a little too complicated right now, that the chiv of covering hair permits up to two fingers of hair to be exposed, meaning to say, you'll, you'll, I don't know, you shouldn't be noticing, but if you notice, some women, uh, particularly in the Datili uh, Umi world, they wear a tichel, they wear a uh, kerchief, but it exposes like uh, some hair on the top, and that's based on Rav Moshe's psak that you can have up to two fingers exposed. Other people are very, very machmer in that. And finally, there's a huge machlokas about wigs. Uh, many American yeshiva communities consider a wig to be a, called a shetel in Yiddish to be a valid covering of hair because it's a wig, it's artificial hair or even if it's human hair but it's not uh, your hair uh, but uh, if you we read the wall posters here in Eretz Israel, you find that many of the Eretz Israel postgim consider a wig to be totally not good and it has to be a kerchief or a hat or something like that uh, right, so those are, you know, in short, those are the basic ideas. By the way, I saw for the first time, I'm actually happy they did this, first time a wall poster decrying lack of men's sinias. Never saw that before. Uh, something about, uh, it's come in fashion to wear tight shorts for men, and we hereby declare that uh, this is totally improper, and it brings the Yetzirah into the world. And my mom, I believe his mom is the first time I ever saw a condemnation of breach of sneeze on the part of men. Yeah. Um, regarding the balance between physical exercise and Torah learning and taking care of Ruchnius, how should someone, especially in yeshiva when the majority, the vast majority of the day is taken up by learning, 
how should someone find that balance? Like, for example, if someone's, if Shabbat was at 7.30 and someone's waking up two hours before then to do exercise, should someone also be expected to wake up two hours before then to, lear, to learn extra? Or how? how yeah, so here, uh, although again, I, I, I am uh, what's called Naya Dairesh. I darshan well, but I'm not Makayim well. But I, I am a very big advocate in theory, if not in practice, that exercise is extraordinarily important. Uh, if you're able to do it and you have the motivation to do it, it is really, really, really important. It is a chilek of your avodah Hashem. It's a way of taking care of yourself. And as the Rambam writes uh, in, in uh, Shemona Prakim and in Hilchos Deus, that if you can uh, be healthy and preserve your, your, your physical uh, strength, you will be able to do mitzvos and surf Hashem. So uh, I have absolutely no problem, and I'm very enthusiastic if a person wants to get up early and uh, do exercise. And even, you know, so if you're asking me, uh, if I get up an hour before chakras, should I learn Torah or do exercise? I might actually say exercise might be better if you can't fit it in some other time. Or maybe you could split it, whatever, uh, 30, 30, 30, or 40, uh, 40, 20, whatever it would be. But one should not feel guilty. You know, one might feel guilty for a lot of things that uh, one does. You know, go to Ben Yehuda Street and whatever it is, go out for sushi. Even then, that has a place to it. I'm not even condemning that. But, you know, those are the things you might feel guilty about. But uh, when you take care of your health, uh, <coughs> there is nothing to feel guilty about. It's a very, very important thing to do, if you can. Uh, yeah. Um, is it a mitzvah to uh, fight in the Israeli army? And if it is, uh, how would one go about deciding if it's uh, the Israeli army? Yeah, so, so we, have a, we have a concept in halacha called milchames mitzvah, that certain wars are treated as mitzvah wars. We're commanded to fight. Some of them we don't have today. The war against Amalek. We don't really know who Amalek is. The war against the seven nations. But the third category is to defend Jewish people from an enemy that wants to attack them. That is called a mitzvah war, and that's a mitzvah even today, that when the Jewish people are attacked, there's a mitzvah to fight uh, those wars. So fighting to protect the Jewish people from enemies who want to destroy us, there is no question that it is a mitzvah. However, the question is, how do you balance it with other mitzvahs? So if you're a full-time Torah student, do you take off your Torah learning to do milchemes mitzvah? Now the truth of the matter is, if you were really needed, if they didn't have enough soldiers, you would actually take off your learning. But with learning, there's a general rule that mitzvahs that other people are able to do and are willing to do, so you can do your learning, which also helps the military effort. So that's why there's a big debate in society. Again, I'm not here to Badafka tell you a particular rule. I mean, many of you know the Hester Yeshivas in the Dati Liumi world, which combine Torah learning with military service, and they look at it as a great doing the mitzvah of both learning and protecting the Jewish people. Uh, in the Haredi world, by and large, we've discouraged uh, compulsory, at least compulsory military service, both because of Bittel Torah and because of the lack of a moral atmosphere in the army that can, that can drag you down. So, in terms of each individual person, should I go into the army or not, that's a very individualistic decision. Uh, number one, it depends how well you are learning. Uh, it also depends on how susceptible you are to negative environments. It depends on, could you be placed in a unit that is Torah observant? There are such units, but even within them, some are better than others. Uh, so halachically, if you ask me halachically, do I have to go to the army? Halachically, you don't have to go to the army uh, if you're learning Torah, because you're doing the mitzvah of Talmud Torah. Uh, if you're asking me halachically, am I allowed to go into the army? I think the answer is yes, but you then have to weigh a lot of these considerations. In other words, a person has to ask himself, what is the mitzvah that is speaking to my neshama at any given moment? There are people who feel extraordinarily strong that they want to serve in the army, and that is not necessarily bad. That could be coming from a very good place, but you do have to be cognizant of the negative consequences, because there can be negative consequences. Yeah? That's a follow-up question to one I previously asked. Uh, as far as the, we, we say Shema like this, 
Oh, gee, gee, gee. I, actually, somebody, after you asked the question last time, someone actually did send me Makor. And I, I don't remember it. I'll look it up. If you send me an email, uh, you have, I'll, I'll send it to you. It, it, it is based on Kabbalah. It is based on taking this part of the brain and, and connecting it to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and the like. But someone, Mamish, Mamish sent me a Makor for it. Yeah. Um, so I know time's almost up, but there's a, there's a big notion of people coming to Yeshiva and wearing black and white. And sometimes people do it just to follow others. Sometimes people are personally attached to it. Yeah. What would the Rebbe have to say about people who are just doing it, not because they want to, but just to be like other people? And it, maybe could it be bad and not get inside? You know, again, everything is, everything is very, very tricky. To simply say, I want to be like everybody else, you know, that's a lack of individuality, it's a lack of creativity, it's a, it's a mob mentality, you're not developing yourself, right? So I could say all sorts of bad things about it. On the other hand, you can look at it like a team uniform, you know. Uh, I want to identify with a certain group of people. They're, they're, they have my values, they have my ashkafas. And if that's the way the uniform, the way the team uh, dresses, <laughs> so you know, um, I'll go with it. So it really depends on, you know, don't, don't, don't make it a fetish, don't make it an obsession. Don't judge a person by how they're dressed, right? If you want to dress that way because, you know, you're comfortable fitting in, that's okay. You don't have to be a nonconformist. But when it becomes like the measure of what it means to be a religious Jew, then you're taking secondary things and you're making too much of them. You know, sometimes people look too much at the hat and the jacket and the, uh, the tzitzes out and everything else, minus the tcheles bedavka, because tcheles already is a black mark of religiosity in, in, in the, the, the Torah world. Right? So it's okay to be involved in small things as long as you remember that they're small things. But when the small things turn into big things, then your judgment is getting distorted. You know, there was a story, uh, the head of Agudas Yisrael in America was a legendary, legendary uh, person, um, Rav Moshe Scherer, great, great man. He died more than 20 years ago. And he would negotiate with presidents. I mean, like every, you know, every government official uh, respected him, admired him. He was able to get many, many concessions and benefits for all Jews all over the world because he was totally honest and above board and he was tremendously respected for his integrity. And he didn't have a beard. You know, he's in a good, a good everyone is black hat and beards. He didn't have a beard. And even the Satmar Rebbe would talk to him and interact with him, even though the Satmar Rebbe wasn't even in favor of Haredi Agoda. And one of the Hasidim went to the Satmar Rebbe and said, why, why are you talking to this guy without a beard? So the Satmar Rebbe said, I would rather talk to a Jew without a beard than a beard without a Jew. Meaning, some people have the beard, but they're not really Jewish in sight. Here I have a man who's a true Jew without a beard. So yeah, the best thing is be a Jew and have a beard. Okay, but if I have to choose beard without Jew or Jew without beard, I'll go with the Jew without beard. And that's something we have to think about. You know, we have to keep away from overemphasizing chitzonias. Yeah, externalities have a place. And that's why, you know, the rule of the center, as far as I remember, I don't know if that's still the rule. You're not, you know, I think Rav Wiener doesn't even want you to wear a hat like for a year or something, except, uh, some, some rule like that I remember. Right? You're not allowed, right? You're not allowed to. Because he wants to be sure it's part of your organic growth and it's not a superficial thing uh, that you do. So, right? so that's, that's exactly the policy here. Okay, thank you. Be well. And Kasiba Kasima Taiva, good Gibbench Yor should be a year of bracha and uh, for everybody. Amen.